Hello everyone, it's a student webinar tonight, number 54. I can remember when we started with one, and <laughs> we're already at 54. We should celebrate at 100, what do you think? Give us your ideas of how we should celebrate 100. Put them in the chat, that'd be fun. Tonight, we are going to talk about risk adjustment, and we're also going to talk about often overlooked HCCs. So this is a student webinar more or less geared towards our risk adjustment students and feel free to ask questions if you have them. Uh, maybe you're just interested in risk adjustment. It's a great area of coding, one that I enjoy very, very much. But one of the things we have to learn in risk adjustment is how to capture all of the chronic conditions that risk adjust, that carry an HCC. Now, if you're not familiar with what an HCC is, no problem. You can go look at our YouTube videos. We talk about it all the time uh, because we do have a course in that. And it's something that I have a history in and that I really, really enjoy. So I talk about it a lot. And it involves ICD-10-CM, one of the best code sets out there, right? My, prefer, my preferable code set, the code set that I enjoyed the most. However, today I was reminded that we still have to know CPT codes because we were looking at encounters through this particular program was EPIC and we were looking at the 1500 forms and we needed to be able to see on the 1500 forms, and use, there could be several 1500 forms for one encounter. So for example, if they did in, injections and stuff like that. But we were looking for the ENM code, code to say that these are for the encounter that we abstracted the chronic conditions with, and that's the ones that were billed right we're trying to link those and a couple of the people that I was talking to had only been risk adjustment so they weren't familiar with the CPT codes so again you need to be well rounded and know all of the codes one of the things that I started to talk about but got sidetracked was that in risk adjustment you're abstracting but there are some codes that get overlooked that do risk adjust now I've talked about some in the past but here are a few to contemplate and we can discuss them uh, in the chat if you want let me know if you have questions about them or if you have come across a a diagnosis that was overlooked right that we weren't thinking about the big ones were you know we find those we look for COPD we look for uh, chronic kidney disease we look for all those you know chronic conditions heart uh, conditions diabetes I mean that's just a giveaway if we see diabetes because that's going to risk adjust but there are comorbidities with diabetes that are overlooked so Let's just look real quick uh, right now at diabetes. It's funny to say, but it's true. If you want to teach anybody something about coding, you can usually do it around diabetes. And the reason is, is uh, diabetes is a disease that has a disease process that affects all of the other body systems. Every single one of them can be affected by diabetes. And, you know, other conditions as well. Diabetes is the most prevalent in my mind. So E11.9 is type 2 diabetes without complications and it risk adjusts. Right? We don't have anything else going on. We have a type 2 diabetic. And when you look at the different the different areas of risk adjustment, I went ahead and highlighted these so that you could get an idea of all the different avenues of risk adjustment that are out there. For the most part, for a long time, we had CMS and we had RX HCCs. That's all we dealt with. And then we had ESRD HCCs. And then after the Affordable Care Act was implemented, then we had HHS started using risk adjustment, which is federally funded insurances, uh, which again, Medicaid in the past didn't risk adjust. They were kind of playing with a model, I think, but uh, when they started getting federal funding, 
well, they wanted to budget, and that's what risk adjustment actually does, is it budgets. And so HHS started using it. Now, why do I have CMS HCC V22 and V24? Well, those stand for version. And right now we're in version 24. I think when I started, we were in version 18. I'm trying to remember. I was talking to somebody else the other day. And I was like, can it be that far back? Maybe I just don't remember. So every few years you get a new version. And sometimes, not often, uh, you can have the HCC, which for version 24, diabetes without complication is a 19. I'm not going to go into the categories of HCCs and how that works. I'm going to uh, tell you that you can go take a course on that or you can go look at the YouTube videos or do your own research about that because we have plenty of education. Uh, we're looking at this from a standpoint of often missed HCCs or overlooked. So right now we're in 24, but if you're doing some retrospective stuff, you might look at version 22. Uh, you know, so it's always nice to, to have it there. I use find a code as my encoder and they list everything out that's applicable. Even home health stuff is listed in this little area of find a code. Now, if we look at diabetes type 2 without any complications, it also has an HCC for end stage renal disease. Just because it's also a 19 doesn't mean that they're always the same. And there are MA plans that have areas where they just do the ER, uh, the ESRD captures. Now, risk adjustment also has an aspect for pharmacy. How much will it cost to treat a patient for the medications that they'll be taking for the disease? The disease process and there are often conditions that will carry an RX HCC but will not carry a CMS HCC so if you go into a job you may be collecting RX HCCs and then they may tell you to stop for a specific contract or then you may be capturing them again so diabetes it has an RX HCC but things like hyperlipidemia or uh, hypertension is the most prevalent that I think of. You know, I-10 carries an RX HCC, but it doesn't carry a CMS HCC. So if you don't take the medication that you need for hypertension, then the disease process could progress and you could end up with other complications like chronic kidney disease because right? there's a correlation between chronic kidney disease and hypertension. So, of course, we want hypertension to be managed. Just, again, because there's a CMS HCC, uh, if there's a CMS HCC, there's going to be an RX HCC. But just because there's an RX HCC doesn't mean there's going to be a CMS HCC. Now, we're not going to talk about HHS HCCs. Uh, that is another area, like I mentioned before. However, uh, what's different about HHS, just real quick, is that they capture in the moment, right? Their, their model is a little bit different for risk adjustment and conditions that aren't chronic can risk adjust. So they're wanting to make sure they have enough money within the year to take care of whatever illnesses the patient has. So if you're doing HHS, uh, you might hear terms like complete capture, so where you're capturing every single diagnosis. Uh, they do that with CMH HCCs also sometimes, depending on who you work for. If you work for an insurance company, maybe you've got a special contract out there, and they'll do complete capture, where it doesn't matter if it has an HCC or not, they're capturing every diagnosis, and then they're funneling it through a, a program for you know, specific reasons. Or they may say, you know, we're doing complete capture, meaning we're going to get RX HCCs as well. So you have to find out what the scope of what you're doing is. And that's another way you're not going, you're going to be able to not miss HCCs, right? Because 
if I look at stuff, I don't pay attention to hypertension at all because the contractor that I'm happen to be working on doesn't do RX HCCs, but ones that I've done in the past did. So it's in there in the back of my mind, but I might overlook a diagnosis thinking, oh, I think that only carries an RX. Well, and then, you know, you go in and check and, oh, shoot, that carries a CMS, you know, uh, HCC as well. But for the most part, chronic conditions will risk adjust and uh, conditions that just need medication to keep them from progressing tend to be RX HCCs. So now we've talked about CMS, ESRD, RX, and HHS, and you see the different HCCs. Don't pay attention to the number per se because we're not going to talk about that, you know, the, the leveling too much. I will probably mention it, but let's talk about what we are looking for. Whenever a person has diabetes, if they have type 1 diabetes, they have to take insulin. It's just a given. It's a congenital disorder. They were born that way. Their body doesn't produce enough insulin. So if a person is a type 1 diabetic, we don't think about cap capturing the, the code Z79.4 for long-term insulin use because it's redundant. Plus, it carries the same HCC as... Um, uh, other diabetes codes as you saw type 2 diabetes is a 19 and long-term insulin use is a 19 and the guidelines you know allude to you don't do it unless you're asked to do it now maybe you're part of a MIPS uh, quality capture and they want you to capture every time Z79.4 is applicable no matter what and they do that with BMIs a lot. Uh, so, you know, if you're told to capture something beyond the realm of the guidelines, there's probably a reason why they're doing it. They're wanting to capture something for statistics. It's not that they're billing it. They're doing a report usually is what they're doing. However, it is frequently overlooked the Z79.4. Anytime you see a diabetic, you should automatically look at the med list and say, are they on insulin? Now, if they're a type 1 diabetic, like I said, they're on insulin. But if they're a type 2 diabetic or any other type of diabetes, they may not be on insulin. The caveat there is that if a person, if a woman has gestational diabetes, gestational diabetes does not carry a risk uh, score but because it is not chronic. As soon as the you get gestational diabetes in the second trimester of pregnancy and as soon as the baby delivers, you no longer have gestational diabetes. So it's not chronic. It There's no reason you would add Z79.4 to a an 024 or gestational diabetes code. And you think, well, they're taking it for, you know, at least six months. Isn't that long term? No. The fact is, is when you think of long term as far as the disease process, we're thinking this is what they have to take and we have no end in sight, right? Whereas with gestational diabetes, there is a standard. It starts and it stops. So it's not really long term insulin use. Uh, the the statistical mindset is is not there. So don't worry about pregnancy. The only time you would capture that is if you had a patient who did not have gestational diabetes but was a type 2 diabetic that got pregnant. Then they are not an 024. That is not the same. They were diabetic. They got pregnant. They're still a diabetic, and after the baby delivers, they will still be a diabetic afterwards. And they may or may not be on insulin, but if they're on insulin, then Z79.4 is applicable. You would not want to mix, miss that. Now you say to, your, to me, I can hear you saying, yes, but CMS HCCs are for, you know, 65 and older Medicare patients. Well, that, that's true. However, 
<laughs> um, there is many a chart that I have audited where the patient is a Medicare patient and they are not that old. Uh, I think the youngest I ever saw was in their 20s and they had end-stage renal disease. So they uh, were on Medicare. And so then your next thought is, well, okay, that person is probably not getting pregnant. Well, you don't know. <laughs> I mean, they could. So just be aware that we don't want to miss long-term current use of insulin, Z79.4. And I know some of you also are stating, well, what about trumping? It, it will trump it, you know, because because if they're a 19 because they're a type 2 diabetic, they're an E1 1.9, wouldn't it be redundant to put the Z79.4 on there, which is also a 19? No, don't worry about that because that is the end user part of um, uh, risk adjustment and unless that's the area that you're in you're not capturing it the coders are capturing the codes right and they set they set the protocol you do whatever you're told to do more or less because that may be something that's in the contract that you're asked to capture something specific but again you're not working with the trumping when you're abstracting that's not in your thought process. Okay? If you are doing the statistical side of things, the what I like to fondly call the business side of risk adjustment, that's different. If you're running reports and, and, and stuff like that. The, the thing that I like to teach about risk adjustment is that you capture everything that risk adjusts unless you're told not to, even if it duplicates. Like Z79.4 and E11.9, because you've captured it, and then at the end they'll weed through the applicable, and their role is to capture the best for the end. It depends: Are you working for a hospital? Are you working for an insurance company? Are you working for provider services? Uh, are you working for an MA plan? You know, it, it really matter so the best rule of thumb is to not miss chronic conditions and things that risk adjust so insulin is one that is often overlooked another one that i came across recently that was really interesting because i had not thought about this one in a long time is t65 so toxic effect of, and there's a whole list of different things that could be a toxic effect. Uh, this particular one was a patient that was a smoker. And, and the provider had documented a toxic effect of tobacco. And he also stated intentional self-harm. And I thought, well, that, I didn't think that risk adjusted. And I went and looked because the program said it did. And, and I thought, huh, I have to go look that up because I haven't seen that used in a very long time. Uh, and when I went and did some more investigating on it, it does risk adjust. It carries, a, which I don't know why I printed that twice. I think I was, uh, my plan was to do the CMS HCC and then do HHS just so you can see both of them, uh, but I repeated it on that, that line. I'm sorry about that. It does actually risk adjust, and it probably does not risk adjust where you think that it does. It It's going to risk adjust under depression. Now, there's several depression codes that do risk adjust, but you have to have higher specificity. It can't just be standard depression. It needs to be uh, either in remission or, you know, uh, initial, stuff like that. And, and there's more description of that, which we talked, uh, ironically enough, we talked about that uh, in our last club webinar. So you, if you're in the club, you can go and reference coding depression. But several depression codes do risk adjust, and some of them only do for an RxHCC. But this actually major depression, the T65, uh, the reason, initial self-harm, uh, intentional self-harm. And ultimately, this particular patient had emphysema and was still smoking. And it was building up a toxic effect in his system that was very well documented by this provider. I was just 
really impressed. Uh, that's why I had no qualms about the the code that he 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 nailed it, man. He he uh, picked the right one, and the key points I have underlined for the documentation because we know as risk adjustment coders we have to be able to provide that meat. We have to draw that line. So for this T6 uh, 5.292. A, to be applicable for uh, coding and risk adjustment, we have to know what is the person ingesting, inhalating, injecting, or what exposure, by what means are they being, they're poisoning themselves ultimately is what it is. And this particular person was an inhalation, right? And then we need to identify uh, the substance and the substance was identified as tobacco, tobacco and nicotine. So that was done. And then third, the third point we need to, uh, they need to document what the intent was. And the provider documented a, a self-harm. So it was intentional, self-harm. Uh, so this is not a code that you would commonly think of as risk adjusting because we think of it uh, anytime we think of these T codes as poisonings and 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 stuff or like an assault uh, or some type of an injury code but not that chronic condition that we see but again when we go back and look at the category that it's been placed in for the HCC it's a 59 under depression so it's a mental behavior, yeah, mental health, a behavioral health type HCC, which that makes sense, right? So again, consider those codes uh, as ones that might be easily overlooked. I'm just looking real quick to see. Um, I'm going to answer uh, answer those questions at the end that I'm seeing over in the corner. Another code that is frequently overlooked is amputations. Now I've talked about this before, which you may have kept captured a lecture or again in the risk adjustment course that we offer at CCO, we talk about this quite a bit. But predominantly we think of somebody missing a leg, right? Uh, a missing leg, risk adjusts, a BKA, you know, uh, but we don't think about the toes. The toes risk adjust too. Z89.421. And the reason I picked this code is because I actually came across it the other day and it was not in the patient's problem list. Now, if you guys are using a program like Epic or some of the others uh, and uh, Cerner, you know, and you're reading that, you, you know, we look at the problem list and we look at uh, the current, it depends on what type of a program that you're using, what are EMR, but sometimes it's a problem list that's active and this is a past problem list, you know, but once we get everything else is okay with the document and we start abstracting, we look at the uh, pick up on certain things like missed HCCs and amputations, but there was no amputation in a problem list. In fact, there was nothing about an amputation in the surgery or the um, the physical, nothing. And I was doing an audit, so I was looking at several months of documentation for that this provider had done for this patient. And I just stumbled across a podiatry note that was relatively recent and I thought huh because the patient did not have diabetes and why do most people that you know go to a podiatrist when they have Medicare the number one reason is they're having foot care for diabetes this patient did not have that so I was curious you know it's like huh, I wonder what they had maybe they had plantar fasciitis or you know or something wrong and then I found a note where the patient had had an ulcer of their toe was mentioned um, on a on the problem list but uh, on, a, on a note that was older it's like, hmm, okay so 
I went and I looked at it and I was, I was reading it and podiatry notes or any type of specialty notes are not ones that you, uh, they're always set up a little bit different, right? And as I'm reading along, I read in um, the physical part that the patient is missing the fourth right toe you know, that they had uh, an amputation of fourth, fourth right toe. And I thought, oh, what? That wasn't mentioned before. Well, that risk adjusts. And usually, you know, you think of it's because they've had an ulcer and they were diabetic, but this patient is not diabetic. So then I thought, what's going on? Is this patient, di did I miss diabetes? Or was this uh, some type of an injury? Was this something that had happened a long time ago, some freak accident where this particular person got their toe caught under a lawnmower or bitten off by a badger? You know, I, I don't know, <laughs> you know, what's going on? And then I also was concerned, like, do we, do, do we have documentation in the wrong person's chart? And it was that person's chart. And if I had not read the podiatry note, I would not know they were a Z89.421. And so that allowed me to make a note for the provider to, to uh, educate the provider on this particular status code because it does risk adjust. And we want to make sure that it's captured just in case whatever caused that acquired absence happens again. Maybe it's part of a disease process or the patient has complications in the future and it needs to be captured. So when you look at Z89.421 at the um, uh, risk adjustment score, note that I grabbed in version 22, don't worry about that, version 24 is the same and it risk adjusts at a 189 and it's under the category of amputation status, the status uh, code, lower limb amputation complications. Um, now, it doesn't mean that the patient had an uh, complication, it's just saying that it's an amputation. Uh, it also, I wanted to show you that it risk adjusts with an HHS as well. Now, whenever you have an absence of an organ, and it's acquired. That means there was some type of injury or it was removed on purpose, right? They weren't born with that. It is not a congenital condition because a congenital missing limb or appendage, you know, that does not risk adjust. But this, uh, but the acquired uh, absence of a limb does for um, the lower limbs. So don't don't look at, uh, don't worry about it being congenital. And it did say acquired, uh, and that is the code that the doctor used to. So I was able to move that, that forward. It, it had been missed for a very long time because it wasn't on the problem list, and that's all dated and stuff. So that was really cool and, and something to find where um, you kind of, Pat yourself on the back that you found an opportunity to capture an HCC that had been overlooked in the past. And that's what we're doing to help providers. So where else would you find an amputation? Amputation is one of those top five that's overlooked and missed. Usually, if it's a uh, lower extremity, you'll find it where the vital signs are at. So they'll list the vital signs, the nurses, you know, put that information in, the clinician does, and then they'll put something like BKA. And you can take that information and use it as uh, your meat, even though the clinician did it. We are, we are able to do that. So you'll see a BKA or AKA, uh, which means below the knee amputation or above the knee amputation. Another place that you could find it is in past medical history. Uh, here was an example that I created for, you know, you're reading along, okay, this patient has rheumatoid arthritis, and you're looking, okay, Dan January uh, 2018, rheumatoid arthritis doesn't, uh, uh, it does risk adjust. And then then, uh, you know, and, and or sometimes I start at the bottom and go up, okay, vaccinations and everything, but then I see moving vehicle accident, multiple fractures below the knee amputation. Oh, oh, 
Okay, so in the past medical history, that's a heads up that there's something's been removed. You can also find it in cervical history. So I didn't add it to this, but um, nasal artery cauterization, you know, clip placement 2011, and hysterectomy for endometriosis 1997, and then you might have a, a surgery for amputation. But I wanted you to see that documentation. I pulled out three places where you potentially could find an amputation. And so it's it's important to be able to familiarize yourself with all types of documentation and risk adjustment. And you'll see these type of uh, documentation examples in the encounter for, uh, you know, it needs to be face to face for risk adjustment or uh, if you're doing discharge summaries, right? Uh, uh, that that is another place you'll you'll find this information. Oh, Wendy says I'm a uh, risk adjustment coder, and I often come across uh, traumatic out tra traumatic amputations. Can they be uh, captured? Yeah, yeah, that's an acquired amputation. Mm -hmm. Now, double. I don't know who you code for, so make sure you you know double check whatever your policies are with uh, whoever you're coding for but yes a traumatic amputation is considered an acquired amputation they weren't born you were either born with it or something happened that it was removed and that's acquired whether it's you know bitten off by a shark or you go to the doctor and you got gangrene because of your diabetes and they lopped off your leg you know so it is the same Okay. Also with the amputations, sometimes you'll find notes in the review of systems, musculoskeletal system. <clears throat> very, very common uh, to find it there. Uh, notice, the, you know, positive for painful, hot, tender joints with a depth subjective swelling. Stump has recently healed ulcer, CHPI. Oh, okay. There you go. There's an all there's a stump, you know. So where's the stump at? <laughs> uh, skin, uh, dry, warm to the touch, with no new lesions, moles, hair loss, dry or brittle nails. Stump observed healed PU, pressure ulcer. So there you go. That's another. You know, it doesn't tell you where, but it tells you that's your line. If you saw BKA in the vital signs and then you see the stump observed Hill PU, you got your line. That person has an amputation. Uh, sometimes you'll find it in the cardiovascular. Pedal pulses will show up because of swelling in the cardiovascular. Uh, so you've got no chest pain, no dyspnea, no swelling of lower extremity, not extremities, extremity. One, and we have two. So that might be a giveaway that, hey, I need to go look around. How come, you know, was that a typo? Uh, was it supposed to be extremities? Um, I've also seen uh, people that had a BKA with good bilateral pedal pulses. <laughs> you, know, so you see that a lot. You know, it's like, oh, so their leg grew back and that uh, left pedal pulse, meaning their foot, is uh, doing really well, huh? <laughs> So be aware of those. All right, we're going to wrap up with CHF and CKD. Now, I wanted to show you how these codes, although they carry the same HCC 85. Uh, now, if a person has CHF, which is congestive heart failure or heart failure unspecified, which is CHF, the I-50.9. Uh, we don't, if a person has CHF for very long or they've gone to the cardiologist, they have been identified not as a, as a unspecified heart failure or CHF. They usually have a higher specificity. So you would think that if they have a higher specificity, maybe that would give them a different HCC. It doesn't in, in this particular category. However, 
that's something we always want to make sure that we're looking for. You know, if a patient has, uh, for the last five years, has been a I5 0.9, that there's some specificity somewhere in documentation that uh, you know we need to we need to find out because we have to remember we're collecting this for statistics. So a higher specificity might be an I five zero point four one, so acute CHF, and it's con, uh, it's systolic and diastolic. Uh, sometimes you'll have just systolic, sometimes you'll have diastolic and systolic, diastolic, or you know, it'll say systolic on diastolic or back and forth. I can't remember exactly how it reads, but it is still an 85, you know, uh, but our job is to always capture the highest specificity of the code based on the documentation that we're given, even though it still carries an 85. But what if a person has I13.0, so they have hypertensive heart, they have they have hypertension, they have CKD, and they have uh, CHF. Then they're going to be the I13.0. Well, that also risk adjusts at an 85. So you think, oh, well, wh what are we missing then? You know, why is this overlooked? Because if they're an I13.0, they are also a CKD patient, and CKD carries a risk adjustment score of 137. And so, again, that is often overlooked. They get so wrapped up in making sure they've got the, uh, the heart failure code, the CHF code, that they forget the, um, the, I, the N18.4. So we don't want to miss that. And, you know, if you go and you look at uh, hyper, uh, hypertension and CKD, that does, if it even risk adjusts it, it you know, the, the CKD risk adjusts, but hypertension doesn't risk adjust. And uh, so it doesn't carry, I don't believe it carries a, um, an HCC, the, the um, I12 doesn't. The I13 does and the I10 does not, but the I13.0, I could be wrong on the I12, but I'm pretty sure it doesn't risk adjust. So it has to ha be CHF and um, I12 is without CHF, without heart failure, so it wouldn't risk adjust. So we got to get to the highest specificity. Don't confuse an I13 with an I12. <laughs> That would be a missed one. Diabetes, diabetes. Not all the diabetes risk adjusted a 19. Sometimes when they have comorbidities, uh, other organs are being affected, they risk adjusted an 18. So we wanna make sure we always catch the highest specificity. And I created this little graph. I've got it up on my wall uh, so I can go look at it really, really quickly. I try to use kind of uh, layman's terms or word terms that, you know, hit me in the head. So sometimes renal, I know renal is kidney, but you could write kidney there if that helps you. Eyes, ophthalmic, right? Uh, so whatever works for you. And uh, neuro, because uh, the neuro codes don't really aren't really the brain, it's more of the, uh, instead of the central nervous system, they're codes for the um, peripheral nervous system. And so uh, we don't actually think, we could say nerves, I guess, but when you have peripheral neuropathy, your or mononeuropathy, that's gonna be an E11.5 in the heart, and also circulation problems. Uh, the E11.6, other, of course, if we don't have that, uh, be able to tie that in, um, I know um, uh, some like to use it for, um, gosh, LATA, LATA diabetics, uh, it, or was that an E13? I can't remember, but uh, so it's, it's an other complication. There is a diagnosis uh, there's just not a code for it. And then E11.8, unspecified complication, and then E11.9, just our standard diabetic code, unspecified. Standard diabetes type 2. So it would be very, very good 
for you to familiarize yourself, uh, especially with the eyes, often overlooked. If a patient has glaucoma, it's going to be an E113. If a person has cataracts, it could be an E113, and there's a there's an other in there. Um, uh, so the, the diabetes affects the eyes, and we don't want to miss having those captured at the highest specificity. Okay, I think that wraps up. Yes, it does. So let me look at the questions. Uh, let's see. So if a patient is already diabetic and on insulin, then gets pregnant, how is that coded? Yes. So Lori, that is, of course, coded if they're a type 2 diabetic then they would be an E11.9, then the Z code for long-term insulin use, and then your regular, regular pregnancy codes, but not 024 uh, gestational diabetes, because they do not have gestational diabetes. Gestational diabetes is a disease process in and of itself. It's very unique, set aside. Okay. Uh, so if a person is a di type 1 diabetic, that would be an E10.9, and they got pregnant, then you wouldn't have to use the insulin, long-term insulin code if you didn't want to, because they're a type 1 diabetic, and it's redundant. You already know that they take insulin, and you would be hard-pressed to find a type 1 diabetic that isn't on insulin. Mm -hmm. Any other questions that you can think of? Now, there is a lot of other mixed, missed ones. Uh, ostomies, you know, artificial openings, you don't want to miss those. Those are the risk adjust. And BMIs, you want to, uh, 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 morbid obesity risk adjusts, and your BMIs over 40 risk adjust. And uh, if it's under 19.9, it doesn't risk adjust. However, usually that's due to some type of malnutrition and malnutrition risk adjusts. So pay attention to a BMI that's under 19 or anything, you know, that's below 20. You want, oh, hey, what's going on? And, um, and, and all BMIs over 40 will have uh, morbid obesity, risk adjust, and then the BMI codes risk adjust that are over 40. And then again, uh, if a person is a BMI under under 20, you need to find out why. And and if it's listed as malnutrition, that code does risk adjust. All right, so what I would appreciate you guys doing, especially for the students, go out to the club, go to your student portal, let everybody uh, uh, talk about uh, ones that you've missed or you've seen missed so that we can all be on top of it. Examples would be great or questions that you have about it. If you're not in our club, feel free to join the club. It's real easy, cco.us forward slash club, and then you get access to all these lectures. Uh, oh, seizures. Wendy, thank you. Yes, epilepsy does risk adjust. Yeah. So does rheumatoid arthritis, but osteoarthritis does not. Osteoporosis does not but um, uh, some fractures due to osteoporosis will risk adjust. Not all of them. Like a Coley's fracture doesn't, which is very common with elderly people. All right. I think that's it. Thank you guys for your questions. And we'll see you in the club, uh, students, and we'll answer more of your questions there. Thank you, guys. Bye.